Good evening and welcome to Horror. I'm Lee. I'm Chris. Hi, I'm Adam. Hi, I'm Jennifer. Yay! <clears throat> Jennifer's Hello. back. Yay! And older. <laughs> yeah, yes. Mm. This is my. Are you wiser? A wiser, oh, always wiser. Yes, than everyone. Well, wiser than me, certainly. Mm. <laughs> when when is your face. peak? Well, yeah. When's my peak? Yeah. Um, well, they've got cats, not dogs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll never peak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's leave that there. And I was going to say, what I would say wiser than uh, wiser than she was, but of course she still picked this film. So um, <gasps> we'll, we'll uh, oh, that 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 could that could be a subtle hint wait, at wait what's to come. Uh, you know, ideas. Rebuttal. Yeah, lines are being drawn. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so our main event this evening for Jennifer's birthday choice is Interview with the Vampire, aka How to Be a Prick to Someone for Generations. Um, <laughs> I live my life to be fair. <laughs> Watch that film. I'm like, this is brilliant. <laughs> anyway, before that. So before that, in our run up, uh, we shall do our uh what we have been watching. Chris, what have you been watching? Right. No. It's possible, <laughs> it's possible if none of you have seen this, that you will think you've been wasting your time. That is nothing to do with Welcome to our what that is pointless, right? But I'm gonna read out something. And I'll see your responses. So I've been watching. Wait for it. Wait for it. I've been watching ball fondlers on interdimensional cable. <laughs> uh, we've got we've got one person on board here. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, it is Rick Use and your Morty. Eyes, Morty. He's, you've been watching interdimensional cable on Rick and Morty then. I have, I have. So I, I yeah, right. in, enough people have told me to watch Rick and Morty, right? And years ago, I watched the first episode and I was like, it's, it's good. It's just a little bit too maybe juvenile, I felt. And then that was perhaps a bit snobby. I'm accepting maybe a bit snobby, right? But I just couldn't quite get on board with it. Anyway, enough people over the years have said, Rick and Morty, just watch Rick and Morty. Like, yeah. what's wrong with you? Yeah. Mm. And then you had something called a Pickle Rick, which I think must be from mm. Rick and Morty. Yeah. Now that I've reached the episode Pickle Rick, and I'm like, well, that must be where it came from. Yeah. Anyway, right. So, so then someone fairly recently said Rick and Morty. And this was after we'd been discussing all sorts of um, philosophy, science, you know, time travel, um, transferring your consciousness, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I was like, all right, that's it. I'm just going to watch it again. And of course, I got to episode three and I was like, that's it. I'm stuck. I'm just watching yeah, the rest of these. Yeah. Nothing else. <laughs> nothing else <laughs> is coming episodes, on. And that's it. Yeah. 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 So I'm now in season four. Every spare moment of TV watching <laughs> capability has been spent watching it. Right. And so, yeah, there you go. That's that's my welcome to horror, what I've been watching. I think there's enough horror in it that you can just about squeeze it in. But I also don't feel that I need to. It's good enough. <laughs> I think turning it's into a, a pickle and then attacking rats. Yeah. Yeah, that's very <laughs> horrific. Mm. It's, it's a fantastic show and yeah you're right it really does delve into some really dark places um yeah but in a hilarious yeah. way so it yeah, is so that, yeah unbelievable writing how they managed to combine so much crazy stuff it's got it watchable. it's almost got that thing that red the wolf used to like had in the sort of early days where you're like loads of people are watching this and they're really enjoying it but they're also being exposed to pretty fucking big sci-fi concepts, mm. yeah. like multi-dimensional oh, okay. yeah. stuff yeah. and things like that. You know, and yeah, as it goes on, and you get that sort of element to it, where there's however many different realities and replacing yeah. yourself in another one, and yeah. that's not actually the original person who was that original person, and yeah, mm. it's and, and and I found out it's not ended. I thought it had finished. Years ago, but it turns out they're still making episodes. Mm. Yeah, it's moved over to Netflix now, so I think they're doing them sort of mm-hmm. sporadically. But yeah, they're still fantastic. So there's Excellent. some there's some new ones. There's some new ones out. I have seen the start of one because it was some uh, they put it up on Instagram, and at the start of one, he meets it's Rick and uh, Jerry meeting the Cenobites. Oh, mm-hmm. um, but oh, there you the go. Like, but. And the whole thing is, is that basically, it, as it turns out, it's because they have to keep spending a night with Jerry because pain and torment is pleasure <laughs> to them. 
<laughs> so they go you don't to get like much a more karaoke pain. bar with Jerry, and that's like they're getting their rocks off because it's that, <laughs> that painful. <laughs> Okay, I can see the pain in Lee's face just from the mentioning of such such a situation. Yes. Excellent. Well done. Um, so, Adam, what have you been watching? Right, I've got a ton, but I will get through it quick. I watched Bone Tomahawk, which I hadn't seen before. Hmm. Um, I've still not seen it. Right. I'm going to say, okay. Mm-hmm. And definitely Kurt Russell is one of the best things about it, obviously, because mm-hmm. it's Kurt Russell. There's some great stuff in there. Sid Haig's in it right at the start, which I didn't even realise. Um, but, I mean, I've now probably indicated a spoiler there by saying, he's in it right at the start. But <laughs> you can imagine, yeah. So, um, but, yeah, sort of, the best way I can describe it is Dark Place, in so much as I think I'd have enjoyed it more if it wasn't so unironically macho. Oh, okay. It's quite a sort of, like, we're stoic men going to do stoic things. And, you know, people who are like sort of, you know, and just lots of no nonsense men in the wilderness arguing. Um, but yeah, not bad, but sort of oddly, best way I can describe it is I think when I summed it up with Claire, when it came out, I thought that looks good. Then I left it. Then another film came out by the same director called Dragged Across Concrete, which was Vince Vaughn, again, in, not in a funny role, hmm. but Vince Vaughn in a prison riot film. And I was like, oh, that sounds fucking awful. But I still want to see Bone Tomahawk. And then the guy made a third film, so he's pretty pro- prolific, but that was a bar where some like Gulf War veterans drink uh, and these old boys have to defend it against a group of young punks who've turned up. I think they're basically canon films. Yeah. Is the best way I can put it. You know, they're a bit sort of Chuck Norris sort of E. So, yeah. but I mean, I I enjoyed it while it lasted, but there was definitely, a, there was a distinct level of sort of, oh, you you haven't moved on here, really, have you? <laughs> you've, not, you've not thought that there might be a bit more nuance needed in this, but it does feel, but it does feature some really graphic, um, a really graphic scalping and chopping someone in half and stuff. But yeah, overall it was sort of okay. okay. Um, but yeah, glad, glad I've watched it. Glad I didn't pay for it. Um, well, it was on Prime, so I paid for it technically. But you know yeah. what I mean. You um, with your soul, Adam. Yeah, yeah it, feel, it feels free. Yes. Soul. Yes. Not free with Amazon. I, it's got a I've lot of kind of soul. paid for it. Jeff Bezos clearly hasn't. <laughs> so, as he wanks in his spaceship. Um, then I watched uh, Fanny Lie Delivered, which is um, like, uh, it's set just after the English Civil War. And it's kind of a, um, it has a sort of a bit of a Western feel to it, weirdly, mm-hmm. um, like a revenge Western feel to it. But basically, um, Maxine Peake, is married to Charles Dance. Obviously, it's a loveless marriage because it's in England during the Puritan age and he's a man of God. So it's basically, you know, he's just a prick. Um, and then two people turn up and expose her to other religious concepts, basically their ranters, which was a, a, the first blossoming of the notion of a God within, mm-hmm. but, but also their pricks as well and it's it's just a really good film in the sense that basically by the end of it she has come to her own conclusion but it's not through anyone else it's through observing and experiencing but yeah but it's also it has that nasty which find a general edge oh. you know where it's that that sort of a thing where it, it basically it feels like that done small scale because there's only like eight people in it Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's uh, definitely worth checking out. It's not horror, but it's sort of it. It feels a bit of folk horror just the way it is because it's that period of time. Yeah, but, yeah, you know. And there's some sort of gruesome moments and stuff like that. But basically, yeah, no, that's a that's a good one. I also watched Under Gods, which is a film which is like a sort of sci-fi anthology set in a future dystopia, um, which was. Really good. Not quite sure. I think it's one of those ones where I'd sort of 
half recommend it in so much as if it sounds like it's your bag, go for it. But I don't know if it's for everyone. It might be not for everyone. So I might, <laughs> I might suggest they cover it. Um, and um, yeah, it's basically three stories of, well, basically fucked up things happening in this sort of possibly Eastern European dystopian future. But it's two corpse collectors telling each other stories. Um, as, as they drive around picking up bodies for either meat or slavery and um, yeah it's it's good it's fucking brutal in places and it's also but it's packed with really good character actors and it's oddly funny but in that sort of way that you know how if you watch Brazil hmm. like the Terry Gilliam film and it's like it's funny but if you identify or feel yourself in that position it's a fucking nightmare yeah it has that it's that sort of a feel to it but um but yeah that was um genuinely genuinely good and on recommendation from bobby from not for everyone podcast um i watched um most of series one and two, all of series one and most of series two of a sketch show called i think you should leave okay. which i really recommend everyone watch it it's it's like a sort of i don't know it's like a bit like a dark big train or something like that it's just sort of i can't even begin to describe the sketches but some i mean this it's it's american um it's tim i can't remember his name tim robinson from i think from tim and eric's awesome show i'm not sure but um but yeah it's just a really good sketch show and the great thing is, is all the episodes are like 17 20 minutes so okay. There's nothing that outstays its welcome in them, but there's some great sketches. There's like one where it's um, the girl who's invo- invited her snobby older boyfriends to a party, and they're playing. You know the game where it's like you uh, take names out of a hat and you have to describe oh, yeah. them. You know, it's that game, but he keeps coming up with like obscure jazz people and something like. <laughs> what do you mean you've never heard of, of weightless sugar Ray? Enoch, he's <laughs> but he was on the Colgate Jazz Hour every week. Come on, you know. So, um, but yeah, and just and sort of nicely childish and sort of yeah, yeah. It's definitely worth it. Uh, definitely worth to watch that one. Um, also, I've been listening to there's two podcasts. One I discovered, Alexi Sale has a podcast, mm. and that's just really worth listening to. Just hear a grumpy man talk about weaponry and what's wrong with the world uh, in, <laughs> we've, in, we've got Lee way. for that <laughs> well, we've got Lee for that but it, when I don't speak to Lee I get to listen to that you know it's, yeah. it's, but I mean it's Alexi Sale pretty much as you expect Alexi Sale and one of the finest things on there is just to give you an example of the mood of the show they have a Patreon and they promise you nothing and they said that they feel that that's in keeping with the concept of how bad things are in terms of just reality. <laughs> that it's like, yeah, you pay us and we give you nothing. But if you, <laughs> but if you pay us like gold standard, you get absolutely nothing. You know, it's <laughs> definitely nothing. And um, yeah, it's just well worth listening. It's him and his producer Talal uh, uh, Karkuti, who basically who sounds like. He's visiting his grumpy granddad and like having his like granddad. You should, but I mean, there's been brilliant bits like at one point because Alexis Sale, as we know, doesn't give a fuck. Um, but Talal actually knows that there's a reality out here. Uh, <laughs> and you have to be careful because at one point he said, Well, I mean, you know, not so much the Patreon, but I mean, I'll send you a special message if you could get me a gun like you know maybe a Glock or something like that and it's like no please Alexi just don't say it because yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's like yeah but uh, okay I want but if you get me it <laughs> um and also a podcast that's just started called Eerie Essex um, which is um um who is it? It's like Eerie, uh, Indiana, but not quite as uh, you know cool. It's it's not it's not quite as Joe Dante, definitely. Um, but basically, it's them. It's um, uh, two uh, two ladies, Bethan Briggs Miller and Alyssa Clark, and they are sort of detailing 
haunted areas and stories from around Essex. Um, and um, the first one they've done is like haunted hotels and B&Bs. And I thought mm-hmm. that'd be right, right up yeah. your alley, Lee, because yeah, I know, you, you, and, I know you, you guys would want to go and yeah. stay in as many of them as possible. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's a, but yeah, it's a, a good show. And also they, um, they've displayed having the right frame of mind when they described Anthony Hopkins as both an arsehole and a git. So, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, and so the pod, those podcasts are definitely worth a listen to. So, yes. Marvellous. Fantastic. And, and that's all the weather. Yeah, if, uh, definitely watch the podcast and definitely watch I Think You Should Leave. So mm. yeah, I've written those down. So excellent. Thank you very much. Mm. Um, I've watched a couple of bits, but uh, nothing new. Um, I've rewatched all three of the Ghoulies movies. Um, mm. because they're amazing, <laughs> but we'll be covering them at some point. I dare say, so I won't go too much into that. Um, and I rewatched uh, Roger Corman's The Raven with Vincent Price, Peter Laurie, and. Uh, Boris Karloff, isn't it? Boris Karloff, that's his name, wasn't yeah. it? Um, yeah, which again, in the in the fantastic world of Roger Corman, where he would basically take an Edgar Allan Poe story, take the name, and then entirely write something that had nothing to do with anything, really. And then um, they yeah, 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 So basically, it's battling wizards, Ooh. and it starts with a raven turns up at the window, he lets it in, and it's Peter Laurie who's been bewitched into being a raven. Oh, he's, he turns him back, and he says, that prick up the hill did it. By the way, your dead wife isn't really dead. Ooh. He's got her enchanted up there, and they go up there to try and get his wife back, and it's um, it's mental. Uh, yeah. But it's fantastic fun, and it's really it's really funny, and it's really brightly coloured, and it's, mm. it's all the great things that Roger Corman's oh, comedy horror stuff mm. was, really. So... Um, yeah. We should definitely, again, we should definitely cover it on the show at some point, especially because I know Claire's requested to see more Vincent Price, and that's definitely one I've got mm. lined up. Yeah. Because it's, yeah, just a great little run around that film. Yeah. Definitely. Nice. Um, Sounds well, great. Uh, quick RIP, obviously, um, and I think it's as horror related as, as music gets, really. Uh, obviously, Joey from Slipknot died at 46 mm. this week. Yeah. Yes. As far as I'm aware, they still haven't said why. His family just said he died in his sleep. Um, yeah, but his yeah. passengers died screaming. <laughs> he was driving a bus at the time. <laughs> boom, boom. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just felt that was worth uh, worth mentioning. Yeah. As, I mean, they're definitely a horror band, so... Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I watched one other thing, which isn't quite horror, but we have had a hashtag ask welcome to horror question. Ooh. And the other thing that Jennifer and I have been watching falls into that ah. category. So Adam, would you like to read our hashtag ask welcome to horror question? Let me just bring it up on the <laughs> screen. Open it, get it back out of the envelope. He's opening it up from the mailbag. Yeah. Come, come out of the golden envelope. Uh, right. That's in this. And, uh, and this, this part of the show, we call it Ask Welcome to Horror. And uh, this week's Ask Welcome to Horror comes from a Bobby from Texas uh, who has asked, what is the best introduction to uh, cult British sci-fi television? And, uh, yeah, that's a hell of a question. Thanks, thanks Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, uh, Lee, well, so I, I think I know you've been... What you, you've been, I know what you've been watching lately, and definitely, I'm, um, yeah, that goes on the list, don't we? Um, so, do you want to kick off? Oh, thank you very much. Yes. So, uh, so the main one that I would suggest for this uh, is, as we've mentioned quite a lot recently, is Sapphire and Steel. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Which what which we've just finished. So, uh, we've finished all six seasons in the last two months or so. Um, and I can honestly say it makes no sense. When we got to the final episode of season six, I knew exactly the same as I learned at the end of episode one, season yeah, yeah, one. Yeah, that's actually uh, no that that is yeah. that is either genius or oh, double genius. Yeah. It, it, 
Hmm. Because it kept it kept him for all six seasons. It's a fantastic show. And, it? None yeah. of it is ever explained. None of it ever makes any sense. But it is so entertaining and so yeah. weird. It's fantastic. Uh, David McCullen, who I didn't really know particularly before this, mm. um, is an absolute national treasure. I loved him so much. He oh, was he's... such a prick in it. He was. He is so good. Yeah. He has got a run off the money with Lestat, I think, for later, really. Isn't yeah, he? I think, yeah. The biggest prick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would feel threatened by Steele. Mm. I think I think Lestat, I would just be bothered. Yeah. <laughs> Annoyed. He'd spoil your night, but you wouldn't be uh, <laughs> scared of it. Yeah. Um, Joanna Lumley, obviously, I, I, yeah. it, it was amazing. I've only ever really, um, apart from the, the Hammer movie that she was in, I've obviously only yeah. ever seen her in Absolutely Fabulous, so I've never seen her in a serious <laughs> role. I didn't realise what a fantastic actress she is because in Absolutely Oh, she's fucking brilliant. She's a, a caricature, isn't she? So it's it's a weird thing because, like you said, I mean, basically to give give the concept, Sapphire and Steel is a show about what can best be described as two time detectives mm-hmm. who come from somewhere. They are not human. <laughs> And mm. they turn up and solve problems with time. But it's things, basically, it's time breaking into reality mm. and causing things like hauntings and time slips. And they even do like a future episode and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, like people from the future. Everything is set in the present, like the, the then present day, which was the late 70s, early 80s. Early yeah. 70s. I love the outfits. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, some of them are quite stunning, you know. And um, so they basically turn up and have to solve these problems. There's a really obscure intro to it where they describe all these people, and but they say they describe them as elements, mm, which yeah. is unfortunately fucked up because neither sapphire nor steel are elements. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, you've ruined it, Adam, now. <laughs> I, I know, I know. But the... But the interesting thing is, is that there's sort of certain things in there, like when you dig deep on the mythology and stuff like that, there's sort of things where it's like, can steel exist at the point before steel was invented by man? Oh. Because, you know, it's not a naturally, a sapphire is a naturally occurring compound, hmm. whereas steel is man-made. So it's like, oh, if they send him back in time, he can't live at a certain point because he can't exist as he doesn't occur at that point. And yeah, but it's, mm. that's besides the point, but it's just mind bending stuff. Um, Steel, and, and basically the great thing is, is that you get them, you really understand their characters. Yeah. Almost from the, the off. Mm. And each series is a, is a contained story. So there's like the first one's a six parter, second one's I think eight, which is the Haunted Railway Station, which is probably the the, is the one that everyone remembers or everyone goes on about when they watch it the first time. Sense, kind of, in a way, is it? Yeah, progressive. Yes. Mm. And then, of course, you've got the episode, you've got the story of uh, the man who lives in photographs who has no face, mm, which, yeah. uh, which just saying it is creepy. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's the thing is, you get this sort of, you've got these two people who you are familiar with despite not knowing really what they're fu- what they're about or what mm. they are and they investigate like really creepy weird melodramatic moments and they tend to meet up with like one human i mean they're fairly sort of like small casts aren't they yeah. usually i mean this uh, but but all in all that is that's a definite recommend uh sapphire and steel because oddly enough it's one of those things where it's just really so well fucking done that it bypasses the confusion. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, as, as Chris said, that's absolutely it. To watch something for six seasons and then at the end of it say, at, at, at the end of the first episode, you find out ghosts aren't ghosts. They're just things in the past that are breaking through time. And there's mm. never anything that you learn beyond that ever. But you don't need to. They just make it so... Like it's the characters. It's all about mm. the characters and then mm. trying to beat this unknown, unseen force. I guess probably back then, you know, like the the effects aren't great, obviously, and you know, kind of you kind of had to build on the characters and the mm. acting. I think 
mm. to be able to make it interesting and make it whereas a lot of things perhaps after that you know rely on effects to but as, entertain as perhaps. you said adam there's small casts and small sets because the idea is there are events that are happening in like a time slip so it's always a condensed mm. area so it's only that place and those no, people no, no. who are in the it the bbc had one studio that was it yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, so that's definitely. It's, it's ITV. That's why they could afford McCullum and Lumley. Oh, yeah. That's oh, where all the that's where all the money went. Oh, is it? Definitely. Uh, yeah. And rightly so. Those two are incredible together. Mm. Also, also when David Collins turns up as Silver. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, I love Silver. Was so just much. brilliant and <laughs> and Led um, as well because that's the yeah. thing is they do bring in the other and like Led's just fantastic. And again, it's that weird thing. It's like I now don't know why he's there. And what no. he's bringing to it, no, who but knows? you just love the character. He's just because yeah. he's because he's such an opposite to um, either of those two. Because mm. Sapphire's quite quite and... yeah, and then, and Silver's just like he's like I don't know he's like Tom Hiddleston as Loki. Mm. He's mm. just he's that sort of trickstery sort of thing. Even though he's a good guy, mm. you he's just sort of faintly amused by it all. <laughs> and yeah, you know, yeah, but Fantastic. yeah, um, so my, that's my only other thing, uh, which again, I have seen not as much as Adam, uh, but I thoroughly enjoyed. I think Chris Jones came over and watched the mm. whole thing in like one night. Um, is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, obviously. As oh, you know, yeah, this. um, yeah, so I don't know it in depth because I've only seen it through once, but we did literally marathon the whole thing. Um, and I get people's love for it now because it's mm. like the effects let it down because of its period, but it's got that charm about it, which makes you kind of bypass that. Um, yeah, it's so well written and so well performed. Again, like Sapphire and Steel, it's that same thing of just like you're forgiving this because you're in. Yeah, you're just in, you're in because of the humor and the, uh, in Hitchhikers, like with the humor and the stuff. And because the thing is, is Hitchhikers was originally a radio show, mm. and when they and then Douglas Adams wrote it as a book, and then they decided to make it for TV. Mm. And the weird thing was, is they were like, "Shit, what do we do?" Because of we've got this narrator, we've got the book's narration on the radio show, and they were like. What do, how do we do that then? And then they came up with, well, we could animate the readout of the book. Hmm. And the the animation, you know, some of the, the practical effects like around the people and the monsters and the robots and stuff yeah. like that, some of them are a bit shonky and a bit crap. But those, um, like the readouts of the book, like the animation of that is beautiful. It is incredible. It, it's just... And also just one of those things where you look at it and it's like, computers don't look this good now. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, because when they did the film of it, the film was okay. But the one thing that I felt was, is that all the, all the book stuff was all like, looked a bit like flash animation. It looked like, yeah. it looked like you'd gone on Walk Records website, which was <laughs> a really nice, well-designed website. But equally it was like, no, I've seen this. Whereas the, the ones in the TV show are definitely, and, and most of the, it's most of the same cast, like most of the radio cast moved over and mm -hmm. did the TV version. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, with the film, that's the weird thing. You've got like the infinite improbability drive. And in the film, it's like, oh, we've turned into sofas. And oh, we've turned into knitted people. And I can't help but feel that was Douglas Sam's like, yeah, we didn't really have the budget to do it last time. So, you know, we'll yeah. reduce it down. And it's like, yeah, because on the TV show, one of them turns into a penguin and the other one's arms fall off. <laughs> <laughs> on South End Pier. It's like, yeah. Wow. And obviously just, I mean, just the fucking dialogue and the, the humour of the whole thing is just, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. And, and, and Arthur Dent is probably the, the quintessential Englishman. I think, yeah. in so much as utterly inept, <laughs> but muddling through. Yeah. You know, right? But, but it, you know, <laughs> is, is he very polite as well? 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Have you, have you never seen Hitchhikers, Chris? No. Oh, dude. No. Right. It is so you. Nothing could be more you. Arthur from now on. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. We'll read not, not till I've seen it. Go and watch it now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> tomorrow, you can watch it tomorrow. <laughs> Definitely, man. Seriously, you. yeah. If you, it's the yeah the six part series. Watch it, you will fall in love. It is mm. incredible. Wonderful. Yeah, and yeah, it's like the original Rick and Morty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Honestly, it's it not is. far off. Because it has that high concept stuff going on. Yeah. I mean, it's not quite. I mean, there's no Mister Poopy Butthole in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in Hitchhiker, but then, but then, I mean, when you, I mean, fucking hell, I mean, on his own, you've got Marvin the paranoid android, and every line of his is a me. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, I think you're. Now I'm feeling very depressed, and <laughs> just from there, you know, it's, uh, oh, it causes me pain to even think down to your level. <laughs> and yeah, it sounds it sounds a little bit along Terry Pratchett kind of a. I was Very, just going to say like, that actually. Comedy yeah, kind of, yes. yeah. yeah. Mm. In, in fact, the I mean, books wise, um, Terry Pratchett obviously did Discworld, and pretty much the same with Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams mainly wrote more Hitchhikers, mm. so the world built and built and built, and uh, yeah, you do sort of, and yeah, it's just an incredible one. And not only that, but also I think it's one. There's nothing in it. You you could definitely watch it with your kids. Yeah, mm, okay. they would not. They there's no there's no particularly bad language. There's definitely nothing too scary. There's mm. nothing too uh, there's nothing too violent or sexy or anything else it's, like that. It's very English. <laughs> it's very English. Yes, but still but, brilliant. Mm. Exactly. It, I mean, that's the thing. Is that that goes to prove how well it is that it doesn't need. Yeah, sex, violence, swearing, <laughs> and, and car still... chases to sort of, you know, just sell. Yeah, yeah. Well, they say that's all I've got. So, Adam, I shall hand over to you now to finish this question. I think. Well, there's the quintessential ones. You've got um, obviously there's Doctor Who, and I know Bobby has asked me about that before. I think as welcome to welcome to horror people, uh, listeners, etc. I would say go early Tom Baker series, so seasons twelve and uh, twelve and thirteen, maybe even fourteen, because they have a lot of gothic horror sort of tropes and stuff like that. I mean, they do. Uh, who they do who does he go against? Uh, well, there's one. There's one called the Brain of Morbius, which is basically Frankenstein. Mm. Um, a, a surgeon is building a body out of spare parts to house mm. the brain of his master, Morbius. Uh, and um, then you've got Pyramids of Mars, where he faces the um, the living Egyptian god Sutek. Uh, but oh, Sutek I is it was using chocolate bars balanced up. Yeah. You know. No, I'm afraid um, not Pyramids oh. of Mars. No, unfortunately. No, uh, though I do believe that Mars made pyramid. So you maybe that's where the, the whole thing segues. Um, you've got Terror of the Zygons, where shapeshifters are using the Loch Ness monster to terrorize oil rigs. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's just yeah there's a lot of um that's really your monster era there's stuff like horror of fang rock which is basically the ballad uh, the uh, ballad of flan and isle explained in the, a giant shape-shifting jelly there's a lot of shape-shifting um i think it's a budgetary thing <laughs> you know, it's like they can they can, att- they can take the form of a human well that's andy <laughs> so, um, um, what, um, what year or what years that is, that's like the 75 to, basically 75 to about 78 is the okay. um, the sort of rich gothic period for Tom Baker. You might also go for the very last season of the classic series was um, with Sylvester McCoy because you've got, uh, there's a story in there called Ghost Light, which is like an impenetrable Victorian mystery You've got the Curse of Fenric, which is the best military versus monsters film that you've never seen. Mm. It's and it got, everything's in there: chemical warfare, the Cold War, um, Alan Turing, um, mm. z- vampires that live under the water and have become barnacle encrusted, and uh, an ancient evil that lives in a flask. And it's like it, it's pure, like proper 
horror, that one. Prince of Darkness. Uh, but he's, yeah, he's actually very Prince of Darkness. <laughs> um, and then I would say also you've got like the, the very first John Pertwee season is very Quatermassy, which would be the next, the other thing that I would definitely say is if you can find, because obviously there's the Quatermass Hammer films, um, but there is, um, if you watch the original 1950 nine or 1958 quite mass in the pit which it is basically you get the same as the hammer version but it's longer slightly more in depth and there's certain changes in it that make more sense like colonel breen rather than being a young man is this crusty old bastard who is yeah who is the british military he literally is like every fucking thing that's wrong with it. He's a walrus moustached old fart who sort of melchits his way around the fucking nice. the archaeological dig. <laughs> um, in, the, in the early 2000s, they did a remake of the original, the Quake Mass Experiment, with um, Mark Gatiss and Jason Fleming from League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And, uh, well, Mark Gatiss from the League of Gentlemen and Jason Fleming from... The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, yeah, and um, just going through the phone yeah. book, and it was yeah, right. I think they were, yeah. Uh, David Tennant's in there as well, and um, and actually one uh, someone who's in uh, Interview of the Vampire, but only in a small role, um, and that is definitely worth watching mm. because it give. Basically, what happened was is the original Quake Masses went out live, and they didn't film them. Yeah, for uh, that, like they didn't. Yeah. So they don't exist. No. So. For the anniversary, it was like the anniversary of the uh, like BBC or whatever like that. They basically performed it live on telly. Wow! So they actually did it live, but it's av- it's available to watch, and it's wow. yeah, genu- genuinely, genuinely really well done. Um, we were we I tell you what, if you want to try and date it, um, the night that they did that, um, the Pope died, and we went to see Noel Fielding live. So. Yay! <laughs> Good all round then. <laughs> yeah, when Russell Watson came out and just said, Pope's dead. <laughs> I don't even have to use a microphone now, do I? No. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so quite quite a mass, sort of definitely that sort of 70s period Doctor Who. Um, also, Spearhead from Space, which has got the best fucking concept in the world. It's John Pertwee's first story. He turns up on Earth, as do a load of meteorites that contain an entity that has the ability to uh, animate plastic. And basically, uh, shot window dummies come alive and kill the populace. Yeah, um, yeah. While a giant squid is being grown in a tank. Oh, it's yeah. 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 Um, the uh, funnily enough, one of the ones that Bobby mentioned on the when he sent us the message was uh, the prisoner. That again, it's sort of sci-fi, but be- definitely more spy-fi. It's from the because basically. Patrick McGowan, uh, who everyone who watches Columbo knows quite well, um, basically Patrick McGowan was in a TV series called Danger Man, which was a espionage show, like sort of James Bondy sort of type thing. Um, he was actually offered the role of James Bond before Sean Connery, but turned it down because it was a bit too. Uh, he thought it was a bit too pervy, so which, <laughs> you know it's like, I, I can understand where he's coming from. Bond Bond is not exactly you know a um, he's not exactly a feminist. Surely he was a bit ahead of his time. I mean, about now, we'd all be applauding him. But back then... Exactly. Back then, everyone was like, why is, why is he rejecting him? He'll be a star. Um, but yeah, so he was doing this series called Danger Man. He didn't want to do Danger Man anymore. And then he came up with the concept, and it's still a grey area whether it's meant to be a continuation of Danger Man or he's playing a different character. But basically, his character, this, uh, he's a secret agent who resigns, gets gassed, and wakes up in an, a village somewhere possibly mediterranean because of the weather where and it's um it's just this weird sort of mix of uh architectural styles and everything else like that and basically each week a different villain tries to break him so the controller of the village he is uh, no one in the village has a name he is number six the uh main villain of uh, the film is our number twos uh, so and he's and he's seen more number twos than the gentleman's closet at Victoria Stage. Um, but so and you get you get a lot of like Leo McKern turns up in one Peter Wingard's a number two in another one, and so there's some really big fucking names in there that you sort of know and recognise. And um, basically, it's it's the various 
ways they try and get him to tell them why he resigned. And you never know whether it's his own government that's kidnapped him or a foreign power that's kidnapped him to get his secrets. And it goes bizarre and there's fantasy drugged episodes, VR, um, you know, and this is all like 1968, so it's uh, 1966. So it's quite ahead of its time, at, but still quite nicely psychedelic and yeah. groovy. Um, but yeah, at the heart of it, it's just a, it, there's a lot of allegory in there, but it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely worth, that's definitely worth checking out. And it's sort of, like I say, borders more into the sort of more spy action sort of stuff, like the Avengers and things like that that we, uh, we had uh, back then. Um, I think that would. I think that's 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 the ones that I can think of at the moment. I mean, the only other thing I could no, it's not really. It's more fantasy. I was going to say like Neverwhere, but that's fantasy. Um, but as I discuss, I was having a discussion with somebody recently about Neverwhere. Oh, it was a family party, and we were talking about Neil Gaiman, and someone mentioned Neverwhere, and I said they said they'd read the book, and I said, did you ever see the adaptation? And they said, no, but they'd heard good things. And I was like, you really need to see it. It's, I don't yeah. think it would have aged terribly well, but I remember really enjoying it back in the day. Yeah. I don't know if it really yeah. made it to DVD, is it? It is on DVD. I think it's on I Blu-ray think... now. But wow. it's basically the only thing, genuinely the only thing that lets it down um, is the fact that they made it on videotape. Um, so it, has, it, doesn't, it doesn't look as crisp as film unfortunately yeah. it's just that the videotape always kind of looks cheap and it's yeah. the same thing it's like but it's also that thing where like especially old bbc shows where you'd get that you move out of the studio and then you're on location but they had to use a film camera yeah because they they didn't have the ability to do outside so although i quite the one thing i quite like with video is that for a while, video was like, because it was the sort of instant thing, it was what they used for stuff like sporting events and things like that. And it oddly, get, and like the news. So it oddly makes it a bit documentary looking because yeah. you feel that it's been filmed at that point rather than, you know, lovingly put together. Mm. Um, but no, never, Neverwhere is still, uh, I think that's still a, that's still a goer, definitely. Excellent. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. So... We are now going to head into our main event. Uh, the reason Jennifer has joined us this evening, uh, one of her favourites. Well, I think I thought about it, I don't know why, ages ago, and thought, oh, I'd quite like to watch that again. Does it stand up? It was because Dean had bought us the quiz book and we did the quiz yes, page. Yes, that's right. Interview. And I was oh, like, oh, yeah. Don't, don't remember know. any of it. Yeah, exactly. I was like, I loved it at the time. Don't know if it's going to stand up. Let's watch it and see. And we uh, no, I think you really liked it at the time because you liked Brad Pitt, right? I, I think there's many reasons I like which, it. Which, but... which is way better than liking Tom Cruise. <laughs> oh, so yeah. you get a plus one for that, right? Now, um, I didn't particularly like Brad Pitt at the time. However, over the years, I've liked him more and more and more. And so I quite liked rewatching this oh, yes. and appreciating it in a different way, you know perhaps than I did. At did the I time. make you watch it at the time then? Well so I don't I don't actually think you did. Now I remember you really liked Legends of the Fall. I think that came before ah. this. Yeah. yeah and I definitely thought. I've never watched that and I never wanted to, but now I think perhaps I should. Right. You I have no idea what it's about. about you need to. You okay. were both big time goths though, to be fair. So it's probably just as much in your well, camp for a different reason, Chris, as it was. But it was only <laughs> yeah, it, 16 yeah. I was when it came out. I was checking the dates earlier. So only just sort of moving into that. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't it wasn't I I didn't use any of this as a yeah, it didn't really fit my thing. I was more mm. black metal slash goth yeah. than romantic. You know. <laughs> Around in Could you imagine me as romantic, really? You know? uh, new romance. So anyway, but, but yeah, so no, it, it was interesting to to rewatch it. And? Um, well, well, right. So, so should we all just lay a card straight on the table yes, I think so. and give it a, a score out of ten, just so yeah, we know exactly where we are? are a score out of ten, what? Ooh. Oh, we're getting back to Moss Eisley now. <laughs> score out of ten corpses in your bed. Mm. Yeah, ten, 10 corpses in your bed. Chris? Uh, I, I, I would 
well, I would give it probably seven and a half to eight. Oh, wow. wow. Half a course. Nice. Yeah. But uh, that, see, eight feels like too high because I've given other things eight that should be higher. But mm. and I, I'm trying to work out what is nostalgia and what is good. And also, I'm definitely mixing up the books with the film. I can't, mm. having watched the film again, having read the books, and I definitely loved the uh, the expanded universe mm. that Anne Rice brings into it, and and some of the concepts of um, you know living for forever or not quite forever, depending on what happens to you, depending on who you upset, right? Um, but yeah, that sort of idea of how do you keep moving with the times is mm. fascinating. And I remember some of these ideas I hadn't really thought about previously to reading the books, and so. Um, yeah, so I definitely appreciated them way more. And watching this makes me think of the books. So that may get it a bit more. As a film, It's I haven't picked it apart fully to, to really think what I, how I view it as a sort of work on its own, I suppose. So, so yeah, you're up next, Lee. Well, I, I, I think, to be honest, a, a bit like I've got a feeling Adam and myself may have pretty much the same opinion on this. I assume. I don't know if I shouldn't assume, but when it first, but I'm sure it's one of the first things we bonded about. Um, it came out. <laughs> well, no, actually, what well, could we be friends for a long time? But I'm sure it was one of the yeah. things that we very much. It came out after a lot of the more violent vampire films, and it sort of introduced mm. that. God, which which ones? Crack thing. Yeah, so stuff like Near Dark was before this, mm. and a lot of Lost like, Boys. Like, yeah. Sort of the more, although they've got that sort of sexy-ish element. Yeah, Lost Lost Boys kind of does. There was actually just just before it, you get Bram Stoker's Dracula, which mm. admittedly oh, it's also, funny, I thought that was after, but yeah, okay. also has borderline sexy Drac, but mm. also you get Kronos, yeah, the Gilmero del Toro film, which is fucking incredible. Mm. Um, so yeah, there was a lot. There was some. There was a lot of vampire. In the air, <laughs> there was, and and I think this was the one that sort of turned that turned it more to the kind of sexy, you know, the sexy vampire thing. So I re- I, I didn't, I don't think I hated it the first time I saw it, but I resented everything that came following mm. it. So I think mm. I got more and more against it. And again, I think it was that thing, as you said, Chris where Brad Pitt at the time hadn't made enough of an impression with his acting, because he certainly doesn't yeah, in this, I've got to boy, admit. He? He's just a pretty yeah. boy. And Tom Cruise and... Um, uh, Antonio? Antonio Banderas. So it was just like lots they're of... They're not coming back. You know, kind oh, of, they are coming, they're back. You're back. You, oh, back. Sorry. Oh. You, you, were just, you were just getting into a Brad Pitt kind of... Yeah, so Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise and Antonio Banderas, they kind of brought Mm. in all these kind of sexy male leads. Yeah. And I was like, that's not... And and I don't think any of them really give a great performance. Now, that's not to say I didn't enjoy this film because there's a lot of good things about it. I don't think any of them give a good performance in this film. Well, right, right. here's the thing. I I always thought from this, and I realised this was one of my first one of the first things that made me dislike Tom Cruise, right? But <laughs> I, I figured this was basically him. He yeah, was just he, playing he himself. Quick, doesn't he? Very well. Yeah, like, <laughs> I thought that is him in real life, turd, right? Which is exactly what he <laughs> But But wait, but you say they don't do a good performance. I, I think Kirsten Dunst does a oh, great performance. So, and, yeah, yeah. And, and I really liked Brad Pitt's performance in this. And also, I'd completely forgotten Antonio Banderas was in it, but, and he's fine. It's, oh. you know, it doesn't, it's nothing great, but it's... It's not a big part, though, to be it, fair, is it? No, yeah, exactly. And I just think his character, it seemed, I don't know, it seemed to work for me. I liked the different... Hmm. Uh, I think Kirsten Dunst stole this 110%. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was amazing. Her acting from being, being her age and acting hmm. her age... So what, what age was she? To a few scenes she's later... 12. Okay. Yeah, like that is and to a few scenes later where she's supposed to be in her forties, but she's still mm. in a twelve-year-old body. And yeah, she does yeah, such mm. an immensely good job at that. Just mm. yeah, breathtaking. So so solid. But I, d- I did really like her with Brad Pitt in it. The way that they, um, 
you know, because it, it really did make me think that is a strange relationship because obviously he absolutely views himself as kind of father figure. Um, and the complexity of her, you know, the way she's pleased at first, but then over mm. time she hates being the age. And then he, he's all, Brad Pitt or um, Louis has always had this, he wants to understand it. Um, and, he, you know, the way that she can see that their relationship is going to come to an end. She almost sees it before him or mm. kind of accepts it. Mm. Um, I just, yeah, yeah, like I just, that, I thought they did a great job of getting across all of that and just how complicated that would get. So that's yeah. funny. The, the thing that Jennifer said when we were looking at it this evening, just before we, we, we watched the beginning again and then skipped through chunks mm. of it because we only watched it a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, on Google, when Jennifer first Googled it, it said it was a horror romance. And I was like, it's two men who never kiss or have any particularly gay tendencies towards each other and a small child. I was like, I don't get yeah. where yeah, no, that's I, So it's... I I I thought it was between the men because <laughs> it's, there it's is definitely it's, it's definitely there. Much more but, but also also the drinking blood is as far as I could tell, they really made that into almost like mm. sex. Like that is it's, a, it's a, a big part of vampire I, I guess it is, but but yeah, I mean, I don't know if they the way it was stylized in this just made it that bit more than mm. but perhaps it wasn't. I mean, I'd, I'd, to be honest, I had, had not really seen, I probably had seen Lost Boys, but aside from that, I don't mm. think I'd seen any other vampire films. Mm. I so, mean, there's, there's what's sh- your score on the doors, Lee? Oh, oh yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah, I got this straight. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give this a seven, if I'm honest. Mm. I'd like, I, I think it's got. Kirsten Dunst is fantastic. I love the look. Of, there isn't a crap-looking scene in this. No. Some of the effects, the, the effect where Kirsten Dunst gets Tom Cruise to drink the dead kid's blood and on like on screen in 1994 CGI, he turns into What's that creature and uh, starts uh, aging. Ha, ha, hang on. I have got some... I've got to stop the presses there. Oh. Hang on. This is fucking incredible. That is not CGI. Mm-hmm. As soon as she slits his throat, on the floor is a puppet. That no. is an animatronic Tom Cruise built by really? Rick Baker. Wow. You are kidding me. Mm-hmm. Jeez, I know I could not I could not believe it. Oh, we rewatched we rewatched oh. just that little bit yeah. once I'd sort of known mm-hmm. about that. And you cannot tell. It is because basically, like you say, his face just shrinks in on itself. Hang on, is and that Tom is... Cruise a robot? And that's why it's, so <laughs> yeah. it's switching in. No, I, I, from what I gather, though, I think Rick Baker showed him the dummy and he said, Yeah, but one thing I can't understand is why have you made it so short? I'm a, tall <laughs> I'm a really tall man. So I think you need, yeah, with, Tom with... Cruise, I bet he'd be like, Can you just leave me alone with this for like 15 <laughs> <laughs> What else can it? What else can it do? Can it grasp? <laughs> that is incredible. What like a vampire? Mm. I've never seen anything like that. Was the thing I was trying watching it. I was like, it looks practical because it's solid and it looks earthly, but at the same time, mm. it can't be because of the it, amount of change. How could they have done it? Through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ring and it is... is a fucking god. Oh, yeah. mm. I mean, it's unreal, it, isn't it? Yeah, it, it stands up so well. Mm. Like yeah, just watching thing. it, you don't think it is that old at all. No, Neil Neil Jordan, like the director, is not a bad director. You know, by any means, no. a bad director. We should. One thing I'd love us to cover: Company of Wolves, because I've not seen ah. it for fucking years. Oh, mm. sorry. Just a very quick note on that. Uh, by the time this airs, we'd have already been, but they're doing a whole series. Anyone who lives in London, we mentioned previously the the uh, Werewolf Brewery. Yes. Uh, that's popping up in Camden. They're doing a series with the Prince Charles Cinema where they're doing... So on, the first one's on a Saturday to which we will be going. Uh, I don't mind saying that on air because it, it'll already have happened by the time this goes out to broadcast. Um, but so in case your fans come and swamp you. <laughs> um, but following that, they'll be doing like every Tuesday, they're doing a werewolf film and I think he's bringing the beer. Basically, mm-hmm. wow. Um, and they're doing company wolves, and they're doing company of wolves, right. they're doing monster squad. Um, uh, yeah, they, they, it's all really good stuff. But the one we're going to is American Werewolf in London. 
Um, oh, beautiful. The yeah. one Saturday afternoon. So it's Saturday afternoon matinee and werewolf beer. Can yeah. I? <laughs> anyway, sorry. Excellent. Right. If, if Lee packs some balloons, Jennifer, stop him. <laughs> <laughs> or he's running around that auditorium with his bits out. <laughs> <laughs> A naked bearded man stole my balloon. Um, yeah, sorry to break it there, but I just wanted to cut in with it. But, like, um, but like, I mean, because he was, because he, because the weird thing is, this is one of, this is so fucking 90s. Like, literally everyone in it, it's like, represents the 90s. And even like with Neil Jordan, Neil Jordan came off, uh, had just done The Crying Game, which was the, like, which was like his big, um, sort of uh, big statement film and everything. And that was uh, really good. And it had Stephen, uh, Stephen Rear in it, who's obviously in this, but he's in loads of mm. Neil Jordan's films. Yeah, and fantastic. Uh, he is just great in that. I mean, the... Um, yeah, and so I, the look of it is incredible. You know, it doesn't... There's nothing about it that looks cheap. And, mm. and certainly effects-wise, I mean... I'm slightly, I've always been slightly annoyed with the amount that they go on about the makeup. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. um, but Adam, apparently. Did you read a bit earlier, though, about them hanging upside down in makeup? Yes, yeah. Because yes. that's uh, because it was like, oh, they took three hours in makeup. And I'm like, mm. what? What, yeah. yeah. What, what, what took three hours? But what they had to do was, yeah, they'd hang them upside down, let the let their veins bulge out on their face and then trace over their actual genuine veins. Mm. But the trouble is, is you do that for 20 minutes, your face returns to normal and then they'd have to string you up again and then do it again. So that they were going through like three hours of that a day. That sounds horrific. It's quite impressive, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. It's quite impressive, apart from take a picture on the first day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Adam, and then just draw digital. Off. That'd have, that'd have cost money in film. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. What? What? No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been as good. Mm -hmm. It probably, but I just don't. Because listen, I think everyone was like, someone didn't makeup. like Tom Cruise and was like, how can we really piss him off? Yeah. <laughs> they tried Actually, to stretch him. Is that what? If we hang by his feet, you might. <laughs> that's what it was. I think it was, it was. It was him. That's what it was. It was like, no, no, I, I have to do this. Yeah. <laughs> so, but um. And, and actually, at one point, he insisted on them having like a closed set. So they had tunnels built so that they could get to the get into get onto the set without without being seen. The <laughs> amazing makeup that you know because he was worried because well, they were too embarrassed to be seen looking I, like that until it was in a film. Because because take take any of these out of the sets and you probably look a, a bit of a know. brick. Yeah, yeah, like if, if that's you know if that's not your normal look because obviously you know I did used to dress a bit like, like it. Yeah, right? No, 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 it's fine. But if if you're not into that, you probably feel quite weird. Not the amount no, they were being paid. Set, yeah. you're not. It's fine. It's, but I, I agree with you, Adam. Like oh, well, it's just to hide. It was just to hide the makeup, and it was like, special effects are great, but the it, makeup isn't much. Was at it all. tunnels? So everyone else accidentally stood in the tunnel while Tom Cruise was up here. Because I heard he stood on blocks. Oh, yeah, no, that's, but, yeah, yeah, apparently uh, they did the old Hollywood trick. He was on a box sometimes. Brad Pitt was in a trench sometimes <laughs> to make sure that he, seriously, I'm, I'm yeah. not, Shoes not on his knees. Yeah. Shoes on, yeah. <laughs> Thank heaven for a little girl. <laughs> Chris starts fucking to lose the trek. Oh, Kirsten um, Dunst, she's really like six foot in this for a 12-year-old, but, you know. She's made to look Kirsten like Dunst had just come off of winning like college basketball. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, yeah, they actually they they had her hobbled like in misery just so that she wouldn't look taller than Tom Cruise. Um, so had she done anything before this that I think she'd done a couple of like bits on TV and stuff like that. Okay. But I mean, in terms of like the because obviously the fucking like I say, I mean it's full of um, uh, so many sort of like the, basically summing up the 90s hmm. but there were <laughs> sorry I've just realised in my notes that I've titled it short ass for the bit about um, <laughs> um, Tom Cruise and his <laughs> um, yeah so there were lots of different people sort of uh, that they were trying to cast for it and um, 
up for the part of Claudia were uh, Christina Ricci, uh, Natalie Portman, and Ever, Evan Rachel Wood. Oh. And like at least because this is the weird thing, this comes from that period where you had like Kirsten Dunst appears in this at the age of twelve and is fucking incredible, mm. and like basically blows everyone else off the fucking screen. Similarly, you've got Natalie Portman in Leon doing probably mm. her best yeah. performance yeah. at the age of twelve, and you've got Anna Paquin. Um, in the piano getting a fucking Oscar mm. and it's like this is just the early 90s was just this really sort of productive period for not only for child actresses but ones uh, who didn't then just like disappear and then the next thing you know about them they're in jail yeah or, you know <laughs> sort of, they, they, they actually did get careers which is mm. which is good to see you know um, but I think I mean the only one I think that they were sort of because I think Brad Pitt was the first one cast for, for this iteration of it, because um, the book was like 1976, and I think it was like a success immediately. Mm. So the rights were optioned very, um, like were optioned in the same year, and Warner Brothers bought them. And then, and at that point, Anne Rice, like the author Anne Rice, wanted uh, Rutger Hauer to play Lestat. Yeah. Which, which, mm. bearing in mind this is 1976, would have probably worked because he would have been young enough. Because okay. that was the thing. By the time he they got round to this, mm. exactly. But then that's the point. I think that's why we're not so drawn to it. You know, actually, sorry. Yeah, uh, points wise, I I'm gonna I'm gonna say six. I think I'm like sort of. They're still all right. Adam, the soundtrack. It's not mm. on. Surely it gets. Yeah, up. yeah. That that that. Also the soundtrack. Definitely. Elliot Elliot Godenthal. Uh and he, weirdly enough, because George Fenton, who did lots of. Uh, Neil Jordan's other films did a score for it, but Dave Geffen, because it's a Geffen film, uh, so I Dave Geffen. I the logo of the Geffen at the beginning yeah. of this. I was like, yes, we're in the 90s. They produced the Guns N' Roses album. It's like Guns N' Roses. I was, was going to say, it's why Guns N' Roses are <laughs> yeah. on the soundtrack, because it was the I, thing, isn't it? We've got to address that. Now, I was, at this time when this film came out, the biggest Guns N' Roses fan on the planet yeah, that closing track of uh, "Sympathy for the Devil." Never I've not, I, well, no, I've not listened to in probably twenty years. Oh mm. my god, it is fucking awful. Yeah. It is so yeah. bad. But like, I love Guns it's and Roses. Cover, so, I mean, yeah, like, yeah, it's oh, not them; it's a cover. I know, but like, you, if you're going to do a covers album, you've got to pick stuff they you were sound told good to do doing. Film. Oh, it's it dog is, shit. It's so it is, bad. Genuinely, I finished watching the film. I had to go on YouTube. Uh, the Rolling Stones doing it on the Rock and Roll Circus because it was like, no, this is what sympathy for the devil should be. Yeah, I sort of, I had to go, I had to go to the ultimate to sort of swing it back from <laughs> the because I was genuinely because I was like, oh great, sympathy for the devil's coming on, and then yeah, as I'm listening to it, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to yeah. listen to that. No, I, I didn't listen to it. Axel's oh, vocal yeah. stylings coming in, you know, oh, it's like. Oh, what? Oh. Yeah. It just doesn't suit his voice. He's got a very mm. distinctive voice, and he's he, yeah. he can do yeah. a lot it. with they it. But that a cover isn't... That isn't them. They're better with their own stuff, aren't they? But oh, oh, actually, I have just got to mention now very quickly. Sorry, I mentioned to a friend of mine that we were covering this film, um, and he's a massive film nut, uh, and he said to me, "Oh, it's my favourite Tom Cruise film." He said, "And I do like Tom Cruise, so it's not you know, it's not a Chris situation." Yeah. Um, but yeah, he said, it's "Oh no, I mean, like, yeah." He said, "But I've got to say, it is fantastically good at being incredibly over the top and still one of the most boring films ever made at the same time." And I was like, "Do you know what? He has absolutely <laughs> got that in a nutshell." Well done, Cloudy, over that one. What? Why are we even continuing? Because they've they've done. Hey. That's the final. That's hey. the that's the statement. That is the statement. I would definitely say. It's a slow it's... turn film, and that's the point of it. It was the 90s. They could get away with slow burn. Children then didn't want instant gratification. Well, I remember It was all good. And it was pre-snowflakes, so there was all the blood and gut you liked. That is true. The mm. gore in this is phenomenal. Exactly. But... It was not a twilight. Mm. It was... You know. I remember this coming out, though, and me being like, what? A film over two hours that isn't Star Wars? Piss off. No one's going to watch that. <laughs> Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, you your little faith. <laughs> before, before you knew that it had suddenly become Deriga, where it's like, oh, well, it's two and a half hours. Get to fuck. <laughs> is is there? Um, I wonder 
what the gender split is if less men like it and more women like it. Hmm. I mean, I, I don't, I don't remember many, many of my friends particularly mentioning it. I mean, it would have been probably more women because of the cast. Yeah. Or also, also could it be like the, the gay overtones? Could that yeah. have put off? Well, in the book, completely. Oh yeah, loads. Yeah, the, way the, more. The, but... the book is far more explicit, mm. isn't it? Yeah. About the, I just wonder if that had a bit of a relationship. Mm. Yeah. Like if that made a lot of men uncomfortable mm. back then. Maybe. See, now I, I, I think it still I, does it now, mate. <laughs> well, perhaps. You see, one of my questions I had this time, I didn't like. All right, the the the, the kind of the tone is there, but I did notice this time where I was like. Yeah, it's always the men. So Tom Cruise picks Brad Pitt, and then mm. Antonio uh, Antonio Banderas also pick. Like they don't seem to pick females as their kind of life companion. But the other thing is, mm. why did he pick Brad Pitt? He was just like, "There's a bloke who's cheating at cards, drinking too much booze, so to and then going off with a prostitute." He picked yeah. him because he knew he wanted to die, so he knew he'd say yes to his. Yeah, but it was it like he just wandering around, just being like, "Well, he looks like he's got death, yeah. he'll do." Yeah, but if you want someone as like a life companion, you'd spend a bit of time. I'd spend. Well, he would have. We don't yeah, have. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give it to him. Like, 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 like Lister doesn't he's come across as being someone who's really emotionally yeah. regulated. He's a little bit. <laughs> He's quite you know, shallow. He's not thinking straight. Yeah, he's just he's, doing what he wants to do, and yeah. it's like I'm not thinking Gen- too much about this. Genuinely, I think he is shallow enough that it's like he's a bit of all right. Yeah, that's and he's not. I wouldn't mind looking at that yeah. for a turn. <laughs> yeah, I genuinely yeah. think yeah, he's that about sort of riches as well. So yeah, maybe that. Uh, uh, yeah, good looking. He's got a nice house, so he'll do. That'll do because he was quite upset when he burnt it down. He was like, yeah, ruined it all. Yeah, yeah. all of our stuff. Yeah, yeah. See, because in the because in the book, it's the other way around. Um, they go and live with Lestat's family, mm. and Lestat's dad is a marquis, and he, uh, but he's also blind, and that's where the line comes in about drinking, uh, eating from empty plates, because mm. they sit with they sit with Lestat's dad and just mm. clank the. While they're <laughs> while dinner's going on, so he thinks that they're eating with him. Yeah. Um, but um, but I th- yeah, no, I, I just genuinely think it's Lestat's shallowness is is mm. what comes into it. But that, it's funny you say that about with the like with the gay. Um, well, it's not even the fucking subtext. Um, no. But with with that aspect, with that aspect of it, at one point, and again, because it was in development for so long. At one point in like the early eighties or whatever like that, Anne Rice rewrote the script so Louis was female because mm-hmm. she thought, oh, the reason this is not getting made is because Hollywood don't want to put a gay couple on screen. Yeah, that's fair. Mm-hmm. Oh, and and really they do. And in fairness, they do fudge it in this. It's mm. kind of a. Do you know what I mean? You can watch it, and they even they even go to the point of using older colloquial statements about. Well, that's my companion, yeah. or you know, my, my escort, or whatever like that. And it's like, no, that's yeah, it's. Is, is that is that not just how the vampires do talk? Because they're old. I, because yeah, also yeah, they're, they're, they're from different well. times. Yeah, mm. yeah, but I think yeah, but then I think that they don't go any further to that. Do you know what I mean? There's there is no at no point do they have any physical sign of affection. And no. I don't mean necessarily full blown sex, or they don't kiss, they don't touch. Essentially, you know, they don't. No one holds someone's hand, or you know, they don't even. The only They're person vampires. who hugs them is Claudia. They're not going to yeah. hold hands. They're vampires. <laughs> well, I th- basically, I think the one thing that this this has come clear watching this this time round, Lestat is basically he feels like a YouTuber who's been cancelled. <laughs> He's just like this noxious prick. Mm. Yeah. And and I don't think that that's the one thing that I don't think that Tom Cruise helps. Because, <laughs> like, like, say, really say if you... to it, Adam. Surely you really feel... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, because because um, Lestat wants to be loved by loads of people. That's why it doesn't... I mean, in The Vampire Lestat doesn't become a rock star because he loves adoration. He loves people oh. to be oh. in awe of him. He does, but I'll equally, be... he won't change his ways in order no, to... No, yeah. Love. No, he's, he's massively stubborn. He's yeah. got no... Yeah. 
He and is, think... he's basically a mess of a... Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. cause I'll be honest, I think that was the thing. The, the book, the, the book, the original interview with the vampire is great. It's genuinely a good book and it's and because Anne Rice basically wrote it because she lost her daughter to cancer. Mm-hmm. And so it's about that loss of a child and the, mm. you know, there's, so there's a lot of heart in there and you know that it comes from a proper place. So I think that was another thing that Brad Pitt got a bit pissed off with in the film is that he didn't get as much emotional narration as he thought he was going to have. Mm. So there's exposition narration, you know, it's like setting up the time and the place or whatever like that. And then the rest of the time, he just looks a bit moody. Where it's actually, you know, it's like, no, I want to rip my heart out and yeah. stamp on it. So, do you know what I mean? It, it's it's overblown and would probably yeah. overend the film in that sense that I probably would find it more ridiculous. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I liked his character being like mm. that. That seemed to suit the whole film. I, I could see... It is you the saw more of, the of him, yeah. So I, I didn't seem too bad. And um, but so what... so, how far did you get on the Vampire Chronicles? Did you read any more? I read. Well, this is the thing. That's what uh, that was. What Tin Lid did it for me is because I read Vampire Lestat, and I read. I think I got like halfway through Queen of the Damned, mm. but it was like he's become a rock star, <laughs> and it was just like it just felt like it was. At that point, he became Tom Cruise. Uh, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was like he. It, 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 before Tom Cruise was sort of famous. Yeah, yeah, yeah but well. it, it really, it really robbed. Hmm. It really robbed everything from the subsequent ones. It's the the weirdest fucking thing, and the best way I can describe it is it felt like fan fiction. Yeah. Even though it was Anne Rice writing, the mm. there's like thirteen books in the yeah. Vampire Chronicles sure, right? series, you know, I think mm-hmm. I, I think the last one was like 2018 or something like that. So they've been consistently released, but, you know, I just sort of like, it was like, yeah, no, I, I don't want to hang around with Lestat. I think he's a knob. And it's like, and, and also it was just, it did feel a bit sort of, at that point, it felt a bit sort of, well, infantile, where it's like, so what are you going to do with this great power? I'm going to start a band and we're going to be called exactly. Vampire Stat <laughs> and I'm going to reveal to the world do... that vampires are real. But what, so, but right what would they do? Because yeah, like, humans don't and essentially they obviously yeah. come from... Um... But then he does spend the whole time telling Claudia not to draw attention to them and telling Louis oh, yeah, not oh, to he, draw no, attention he can to tell, them. you know, do, do what I say, don't do what I do. He's mm-hmm. definitely oh, yeah, that sort yeah, of... Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah. before anyone clicks on it, Mm. I want to do a quick poll around the room, around the around the Zoom. Yeah. Can right. So I want you to tell me how many films do you think Tom Cruise is in? How many films he's made? Films. I'm going to say more than I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thirty. How many? Thirty. Thirty. Right, okay. Fifty. Now, okay, Lee. I'm going to say 70. He's not that old. Right. No, he's done a shitload of stuff, though. He must have done a lot. Well, bearing in mind, say, for example, Christopher Lee topped like 219. Two Michael Caine's been about 200. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? Seriously, oh, yeah. 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 So. You okay, know. I'm going to clarify as West of it. <laughs> right. I, I, I can honestly say I feel the wind taken out of my sails when I tell you Tom Cruise has been in 51 films. Oh. Chris was right then. Of, of which six are still in production. He's been mm. in forty-five films. And that's that it. Makes well, I, no fucking like, sense. Well, I, I thought I was going to say less, mm. but then I thought it's got to be, as I said, more than I think, right? Mm. But I have a sense that he's been in big films. He hasn't been in yeah. hundreds, yeah. but but exactly. still more than I would have thought. You know, I, if if I could name them, I'd probably think ten, months. right? So I thought it's got to be a lot more than that. But because like. Brad Pitt's like Brad Pitt's in something like 80, 80 odd mm. films or something like that. Kirsten Dunst has done ninety, you know, which is quite impressive. I mean, she's certainly catching mm. up on her fucking parents yeah, from this because yes, yeah. that's why I went for because you know, I was like, well, they've done quite a lot, 
but yeah, you're right. He spent a lot of time fucking about with Scientology and other nonsense. Uh, so yeah, he's, well, he's, he's, also, he's also been directing a lot. Mm-hmm. But I think I I don't know. But I think it's ju- I genuinely. I just didn't realise that pretty. I mean, you go through the IMDb list of his films, mm-hmm. and I think there's probably three. I don't know what they are. Wow. Every other one, you're like, I know that film. Yeah. You might not have seen it, but you're aware of it. You might even be aware of classic scenes from it or yeah. stuff like that. And um, yeah, and when you go through the list, you're like, oh shit, he's just only ever been in big fucking films. Yeah, he's and, never had any flops or well, and pretty good. much always been the star name. Yeah, he obviously or at least like top of near top of the cast. Really? I mean, there's stuff like Tropic Thunder, but take yeah, any other film does he? He just goes, can None. I be the tallest person in it? And <laughs> if not, can I stand on a box? And do I get the main role? And if not, screw you, I'm not doing it. Apparently, that's why he fell out with Tim Burton because he wanted to play uh, Willy Wonka because he wouldn't have had to brought the box with the Umba Lumbers. But ah. uh, <laughs> he might have done. <laughs> he probably still needed it. Yeah. yeah. Either that, or they were going to paint him orange. Mm. But. But like in terms, so like, so Brad Pitt was kind of assuming, but um, like at one point someone said John Voight was going to play Lestat and Mel Gibson and Richard Gere. I think basically anyone in Hollywood at some point was yeah. touted as Lestat because it was like the big cat. But and actually, when they said when Anne Rice wrote uh, said about like she changed it so that uh, Louis would be a uh, a woman. Mm. Uh, sure, was in the line to play Louis right. or whatever Louise. I don't know what they'd have whether they changed how they changed the name. But so, but for this round, um, Daniel Day Lewis was originally cast as Lestat and then dropped out a few weeks prior to filming. Mm. Then they offered it to Johnny Depp, who declined, and that's when Tom Cruise came on board. Yeah. Um, they also asked Tom Hanks, who turned it down for Forrest Gump, Jeremy Irons, who didn't want to go through the makeup process, uh, Peter Weller and John Malkovich. And um, originally, the reason it's dedicated to River Phoenix is he originally had the part of uh, Christian Slater's part. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And was going to, and basically, uh, yeah, and again, he died like only, a, I think, like a week before filming. So Christopher Slater yeah, came in. Weeks before, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Chris, and Christian Slater um, gave his, um, gave his entire fee to um, two of River Phoenix's favourite charities. Mm. Yeah, I read that. It was nice. Because yeah. Christian yeah. Slater's a fucking legend. Yeah. Right. yeah, I do love him. I really do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that that was the weirdest thing when I was like, because I was going through, and it's like the thing is with this film is you know what most people have been in. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's like I don't have to explain to you who this obscure cat, who this obscure <laughs> person is called Christian Slater. But the thing was, is when it suddenly I was like, oh my god, I'm back in blockbusters. When I looked through and saw Gleaming the Cube. Cut. Yeah. We rewatched that weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. You watched? Did you? <laughs> yeah. Still holds up. Well. Fair enough. Still holds up your age, I think. <laughs> yeah. And you've been drinking. And also, obviously, you've got um, as she is now known, Tandaway New- New- uh, Newton in yeah, so uh, that's, uh, that's, a fairly small role. That's who I didn't realise. Because. Um, that's her re- but apparently uh that's her real name she was uh they misspelt her name on her first film oh. as tandy uh. and she just stuck with it uh. um but she's decided she i think it's like well i'm fucking i'll do what i fucking like yeah. i'm famous now <laughs> i can go with yeah. well, I've, I've been in westworld and rogue one fuck you mm. yeah so she's never like, no, I'm, gonna have, I'm, gonna right. have, I'm gonna have my yeah. w back i'm gonna be tandy <laughs> so yeah um and um and also a weird one, uh, Helen McCrory. You know the bit where they've got um, they've got the two uh, they've got two sex workers in the uh, room and um, oh, yeah, the that yeah. yeah. The other one who faints is Helen McCrory. Oh, who, you don't see her though, do you? Then you no, know, you don't. You barely see her. But yeah. it's like yeah, and, and obviously like she. I mean, she died this year, but. Oh, really? um, like she's in like she was in like Peaky Blinders and she's in Inside Number Nine, oh, The Harrowing, oh, yes, yeah. and like loads. Of, you know, she's just done loads and loads of stuff. Although, again, and this is something that our international listeners probably don't appreciate is when you go and see this film at the cinema, much in the same way as when you say go and see um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. 
is that you are guaranteed to hear at least a few people go, it's Trigger. Hey, yes. <laughs> that's a brilliant. When Roger Lloyd Pack turns up. Brilliant. Because I think that's what makes this film good as well, is the humour in it. It isn't just horror or attractive men. Like the, the funny bits throughout, I think, are what holds it together. See, see, I think if they'd have played the relationship side of it up more, mm. basically, like the, the early sequence, the sort of early, the first half of the film, basically, mm. is a, like, it's basically a bitchy gay couple. Yeah. 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 Like, well, certainly from Lestat's point of view. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and they, I think they should have just fucking lent into it. I think well, he should have been more extravagant. I think, well, I think he should have I think been... now they could refilm it. It's probably been long enough that they could redo it. And, I mean, in the nineties, uh, you know, people were already accepting and that surely it wouldn't have affected yeah, their box office. I, no, I, 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 I don't. Done it, would he? It'd no, be against the yeah, Scientology. Yeah, yeah. It's well, not only that, but also it's Hollywood, mm. and they are just literally scared of not making money. Yeah. So, <laughs> and and but and this is the trouble. This is what's getting drilled down every fucking year by year and generation by generation that it's like right we don't want to put anything in this that will affect its sale yeah <clears throat> you know it's much much the same as like you know it's like so donald trump will you denounce the kkk no because they might possibly vote for me <laughs> and do you know and i think it's the same thing where it's like well we don't want to we don't want to cut down on that homophobic demographic that's bums on seats so, you know, there is no way on earth, that, and especially, like, I think at, definitely at the time, I don't think there was any what This is about as strong as it could get. Yeah, at the time. In terms of without, yeah. you know, without sort of tipping it. Yeah. I think, it's, I think it's done that basically a lot of thick people or younger people might not get it. Mm. Yeah. You know, so they can sort of carry on. I it's like, I got oh, it just, they're just two mates. They're yeah. just two mates, you know. Yeah, they're just I, two mates go around killing yeah, people. That's fine, Adam. <laughs> And also, I mean, the thing is, in the book, Lestat, he, Lestat is, well, I mean, he's not even bisexual, he's polysexual, you know, he's, mm. he's, he's, anything with a pulse and most things without. So, <laughs> Oh, no, without is bad because then you die as well. So, Only if you Yeah. Well, mm. uh, all right. <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't die, though. Hmm? No. He didn't die. No. He didn't. No. He was a bit a... ill for a little while for a few years in a swamp, but... I got better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite dead yet. He'll uh -huh. be dead in a minute. Uh He'll -huh. be gone. But the now, interestingly enough, and we are, you know, we we're not, we're not fans necessarily of Mr. Thomas Cruise. And genuinely, I think I think in there's two the two elements to this is I like it when he is just literally just bitchy and frivolous and just yeah. moaning at Luke. like the bit like that bit at the end I do genuinely laugh I still laugh at the bit where it's like can you imagine what it's like listening to that yeah. for hundreds yeah. of years yeah. where it's just like oh god you're so boring Louis yeah. and you know and so uh, that I think comes over well and and weirdly enough I think when he is that bit when he returns he is genuinely menacing when yeah. he plays the piano. When he's playing the piano. You've got the music, yeah. which is kind yeah. of haunting, and then he's talking about the swamp and how he survived. His acting and there great, is yeah. incredible. Mm. It, it's, the, it's the best he acts in the whole of his film is during mm. that scene. He comes yeah. across really well. Do you think they really pushed but, him off first? They pushed him off his box. Yeah. Right, now, <laughs> go for it. Do the scene. <laughs> But I think it's the I think it's the sexy foppish dandy bits where he comes over as a bit of a knobber. Mm. Yeah. So it's yeah. sort of yeah. Now, and this is one again one of those things where I remember it from the time, and it's like oh wow that was before the internet. Mm. But basically, they cast Tom Cruise and Anne Rice distanced herself from the film. Oh really? Wow. She, she was like, she, and I re I remember it at the time because it was like a big fucking kickoff. So she um, knew before we did that he's a prick. Basically. <laughs> well done. I, well, I mean, basically, I mean, she wanted either Julian Sands or Christopher Walken. Were her Sands would be awesome in this. Mm. That was the thing is, it was only because he wasn't that well known. I mean, he's still not, but that was the yeah. and but 
he could have, I think he would have pulled it off really fucking well. It, you know, or pulled Brad Pitt off really well. I don't know. You know, yeah. going to up the ante on this. I don't know. So here's a few quotes from her, her talking to the press. Hmm. I'm particularly stunned by the casting of Cruz, who is no more my vampire Lestat than Edward G. Robinson is Rhett Butler. <laughs> um, uh, it's almost impossible to imagine how it's going to work, and it's really almost impossible to imagine how Neil, David, and Tom could have come up with it. I have one question: Does Tom Cruise have any idea what he's getting into? <laughs> and then, and then she actually was saying she was trying to get them to switch the leads. Mm-hmm. So Brad Pitt is Lestat, and Tom Cruise is um, look. He, here's the quote: Yeah. Uh, Tom Cruise could do Louis, he could do that part, the brooding, dark, guilt-ridden, passive, reflective, reactive thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so she really was like a proper... And, again, it's one of those things where you're like, shit, would she have been sued now? You know, because this... Yeah. it's Because it sounds, you know, nowadays, it's the sort of thing where you think, oh, no, someone gets shut down as soon as they try and put any bad press out or whatever like that. And... Basically, she she then saw the film and apologised to Tom Cruise, oh, well, like yeah. publicly, and she even took out two page adverts in Variety in the New York Times saying the film's brilliant. And basically, she properly sort of ate humble pie on it because I think, to be honest, I think it was. I mean, we've been sitting here saying, "Yeah, mm, I'm an R in," mm. but probably it's not as bad a fucking disaster as she thought it was. But then she's fallen in love with Lestat and he's a bit of a knob. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, he's got the knob bits right. And the rest of it, no, but, but the rest of it, he actually plays quite well. I mean, I've only ever seen mm. in Mission Impossible and things, and that's not really a role, that's just James Bond rehashed. So actually, it's the only <laughs> film I've seen him acting in. It's, it's great. Saying. It is great in Tropic Thunder. Go and watch it. He's uh, fantastic. Yeah. He's, again, again, I think he's playing himself in real life in it. Yeah, so he, he does it fantastically. Back then, yeah. before but, he sort of, you know. Um, Minority Report, I quite liked him in. Yeah. Minority Report's good. Was, it's was also it, a great um, film. Was it Magnolia you used to, or Vanilla Sky, Lee? I can't remember. I, I know you. Vanilla that Sky. That sounds like two um, different paint jobs, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's Chris's house. Magnolia, yeah. I've seen a couple of times, but not for a That's meant to be before. good. I've never seen it. I don't remember anything about it. Probably the name, just you know. Yeah, it's really yeah. weird. Yeah, I don't mm. mind it. Isn't that the one where he's hailed the penis or whatever like that? He's like a, he's like a. a no. I think you mixed like a wellness up coach with Dean. Dean was so obsessed with that movie. Yes, he made me watch it a couple of times, and I was like, "It's, it's I, I won't give anything away." It's one of those films that's got an incredibly what the fuck out of the blue mm. ending, a bit like uh, Gangs of New York. Oh, um, right. Okay. It, yeah. It's one of those, like, you watch the whole thing and then it's just, here's the end. The last two minutes destroys everybody's lives and has nothing to do with anybody. And you go, what the, what? Um, yeah. So it's really good. Mm. So, yeah, Legend I don't was remember good. it well enough, particularly mm. to. So does he ever play anyone who isn't a bit of a dick? Um, I intentionally definitely not. It's how <laughs> the character. No, it's how the character may come across because there's certain ones where you're like, I mean, in Tropic Thunder, he gives a proper. It's a proper f- performance. It's not the starring yeah. role. It's not a big. Mm. It's not a massive part. But he does give. But a proper, for a small part, he makes good, it stand yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, he's he really one of the does. biggest bits of that movie. He's the, one of the bits you will always yeah. remember of that film. Yeah, true. Even yeah. Danny yeah. McBride, so he stands out because he's being a bit, you know. Oh yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go then. <laughs> um, a few good men. I should watch. I'm sure. Anyone a few seen that? Men, a few good men's great. He did go through this period because that seems to be the thing with Tom Cruise, where he has this sort of thing where he goes through periods of doing same-ish films. Mm. So like. So because he was doing Mission Imp- because he's been doing Mission Impossible, that's why the mummy was a bit Mission mm. Impossible. Oh, mm. you, you, you're quite right, because he did Oblivion and Edge of Tomorrow back to back, and I liked both of those. Mm. Um, Oblivion- Actually, Edge of Tomorrow might be, yeah, I think that might be my favourite one, if I if I have to go default, if I'm honest. Yeah. So, although, actually, it probably might even be interviewed, just because uh, I, I know it, so at least I can... 
I, I don't I don't have to put up with anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Like you say, we do run him down and we do slag him off. Um, but I think that's more his personality generally mm, yeah. more than his performance. I, I don't. Oh yeah, it's a personal mm. attack. Like, it's nothing. Yeah, it's, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not personal. Oh no, wait, it's totally personal. Totally yeah. personal. It's, it's not really not personal. Sorry, Tom, if you're listening, it is totally personal. <laughs> It's like you can appreciate someone as a musician, but you also want to see them drag behind a car for three miles, you know. So. <laughs> Adam, anyone? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I'm all good. <laughs> I'm not going to throw any shade on anyone specific here, but we all know who they are. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, at War of the Worlds, he was, uh, you mm. know, relatively good. Mm. In. I've been told, uh, Claudio, who uh, I got the quote from earlier, mm. um, he said to me, the "Last Samurai is well worth watching," and I love it. Yes, fucking yeah, terrific. Yeah. I really need to see that. Genuinely, that's a good mm. film. And because that was one of those things where it's like, I'm really not in the mood for a fucking <laughs> like historical samurai movie. It's got Tom Cruise in it, right? Why don't you just just kill me? It'd be quicker. <laughs> yeah, and then and then, and and then, and then blown away movie. by yeah, yeah. yeah. That that probably helped actually. It was like, it's, it's probably a fairly good film, but I was expecting to want to tear yeah, my eye out. Uh, yeah. so, you know, it's like, you know, as far as I was concerned, it was a fucking masterpiece. <laughs> oh, and again, you know, eyes wide shut. My Everything I've said about Stanley Kubrick, I still don't think he's a great filmmaker. I still think he's massively overrated. My favourite film of his is a Tom Cruise movie. So, oh, what is that? That's fair enough. Wait, what, what was it? Uh, eyes, eyes wide, wide shut. Oh, uh, okay. I'll have to watch that then. Yeah, you'll love it's, that, Chris. Oh, Rain Man. Never seen it. Yeah, Rain Man is fantastic. He is, he is, he is Tom Cruise in it again, but he's, <laughs> he does a great job. <laughs> Do we think he just he, reads through these scripts and goes, "Yep, that's me." That fits yep, me I'm perfectly. Yep. yep. I'll be that asshole. That's, that's why he hasn't done that many. Because it's yeah, like exactly. you know, how many have yeah. that perfect character? Well, actually, I suppose if you've got major roles in everything, it's probably how much you can do. I mean, if you've got like a bit part, you can piss off and do three films in a couple of weeks. Whereas this, mm. he's like, you're stuck with this. You film put, for, like, yeah, yeah, you're you're here every day. Adam, yeah? Adam don't like, give him any any ways out here. No, he's only picking films where he can be a prick. Okay, <laughs> let's not give him any. You know. Oh, I've just found. I'm just looking through his filmography. I've just remembered he was shit in Legend. There we go. Cocktail. Wait, 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 wait. No, I can't. I Cocktail. can't remember his his acting in Legend, but the film is good. Oh yeah, the film's good. I just remember Tim Curry. Yeah, you do though, didn't you? And Warwick Davis. Yeah. There you go. So it must be shit. There you go. Point right. He was. He was pretty young then, actually. That was no, Top Gun, even to be fair. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look, one film behind. Speaking That's of great. not being on, uh, like, not being around for the whole film, apparently he never met Antonio Banderas because mm-hmm. he, yeah, he wasn't doesn't in any it. scenes with him. Yeah. No. And actually, yeah. in the book, um, in the book, Lestat is at the Vampire Theatre. Mm. It's mm. him who tells them that he tr- they tried to kill him. Uh, and that it all kicks off, and it's and it is all in later in the books. Um, Lestat and uh, Armand knew each other, yeah, like mm. bef- before Louis met Armand and everything. And uh, mm. can I at this point just say Antonio Banderas <laughs> because it sounds a bit like Beras, <laughs> and obviously, anyone... obviously, he's yeah, Sean, sorry. I was going to say, obviously, his greatest film role is his burger beard in Sponge in the SpongeBob movie Sponge Out of Water. <laughs> so, I was just... just about to say, I really love the Expendable movies, which are all crap, um, and I know they're crap, but I really enjoy them. And he is my favourite character in all of them. He's only mm. in the third one, and he plays the prick who wants to be in the gang, and they won't let him in. <laughs> <laughs> he that sounds like an odd role for him. <laughs> And He's obviously, got Invaders in walk like nothing. I've never seen a real person walk like Invaders oh, in until yeah. you've seen him walk off set, pissed off <laughs> on uh, Expendables 3. Trust me, it's worth watching the film. <laughs> or just oh, the clip yeah. on YouTube. <laughs> and, and obviously, Puss in Boots, which is just the role oh, that he was going yeah. to play. Yeah. So, actually, and 
I'm going to mention there's a film called The Skin I Live In, uh, which is Antonio Banderas, and it's fucking great. It's a twisted fucking film. Is but it's... Ricci? No, no, no. This is... Um, basically, the plot of this is... Um, to get revenge on someone, he transforms them. I'm not going to say any more than that because I think it would ruin the film. But, yeah, it's pretty dark, but he is fucking great in it. And, and um, yeah, he, it's, well, certainly a bit better than he is in this because I do think he's a bit sort of... It, I'm, I'm waiting for this every time he's sort of finished. I've just... Oh. Sorry, sorry. So he does seem to be a bit tired. That's the problem with all of them. I think it's it's such. It, it sounds difficult because I said I like this, but it feels so melodramatic. Everyone feels out of their comfort zone. So although I don't think it many happens. of them, I don't think many uh, yeah that that yeah I see that that seems to fit. You but... see what I mean? Like, so I don't think any of them mm. give a good performance apart from uh, Kirsten Dunst. But I think they're all hard characters to pull yeah, off because you need but, to but be she's, quite yeah, but she is, to be she is really melodrama. she is really emotional because mm. she's like been um, denied, you know, ever being able to grow up, and she sees. Where's the rest of them? They're all jaded, ruined husks of a, you know. Yeah. But they I need something to to really live enliven them. The, yeah, because yeah, just. That, that should be what happens with Armand, really, is that he should be really bored and then livened up by Lewis. But, but it, well, yeah, so I guess they perhaps could include that. But, but that is it, because that's why he didn't mind Louis destroying the, you know, the rest of his... Um, yeah. Yeah, he oh, no, he doesn't give a fuck. His yeah. theatre group, yeah, because he, he just, he knows that that all needs to pass and he wants something to, yeah, yeah. give him some more right. energy and bring him into the new world. Mm. I mean, that, oh, it, is one of the best lines. that is one of the best lines in the film, though, is where he says to him, I can teach you not to regret. Mm. And mm. then he says to him, well, I know that you don't care about what I did there because you've just told me that you can you have no regret. Yeah. And it's yeah. That's, yeah. You know, I think because. But, but that's again, why for me, it's, it's, it's the characters, their relationships I really worked. I thought I did like that. In, I mean, in the book, he goes off with Armand. Mm. Mm. Like they travel together for years. Yeah, yeah. So, which, so I find the film kind of makes a much more emotional sense in that, where it's like, no, fuck you. Yeah. Mm. Because it is like, well, no, no, yeah, it's not even that it's the thing that he knows that he doesn't regret killing Claudia. Yeah. Because mm. it's like, well, you've just told me you don't care. So, mm. you know, I, <laughs> and, um, not only that, but also from what I I mean, apparently at one point Brad Pitt was so pissed off making this film that he rang Dave Geffen and said how much to get out of being in this film. Wow. <laughs> and where Tom I, Cruise I, loves I, him. <laughs> apparently <laughs> and, I mean first and dance. Yeah, really. it could be. <laughs> where is I because I had to I had to get the quote because it just it just caught me really. Yeah. So because it, it basically it was just the grueling aspects of doing it but where is it six months in the fucking dark contact lenses makeup i'm playing the bitch role i'm telling you one day it broke me right life's too short for this quality of life i called david geffen i said david i can't do this anymore i can't do it what will it cost me to get out and he goes very calmly 40 million dollars <laughs> and i go okay thank you and it actually <laughs> took the anxiety off me as i was like well, I've got a man up and ride this through. <laughs> but apparently, yeah, he was just like utterly like he just it just got on top of him. And I suppose it's it's understandable. That's probably why it's like everyone everyone seems like knackered and strung out. And it's like yeah, because yeah, I've yeah because I've been working nights for the last three, and my every working day starts with three hours of being pinned yeah, upside yeah, down. From it, really. <laughs> I think they went out for parties, you know, to get the staff morale up afterwards. Oh, no. Well, you, you Tom probably, Cruise did some probably... cocktails, you know, and... Uh... Well, yes. you, I'd imagine it gets all a bit... Um, it gets a bit J-Lo. You're probably not allowed to look Tom in the eye. Uh, here, well, here is a list. Of, right. <laughs> here, is a, here is a list of conversations that you could have with Tom. Uh, subjects 
for apparently that this is a true thing. Hmm. Sylvester Stallone, if he does like meet and greets or whatever like that, um, you have like basically you take a topic out of a hat when that's that it. he's pre that he's pre approved that he might be interested in having a conversation with you about. Oh, oh, and there's all like stories of like, oh, it was your friend, it was a friend of Claire's, and apparently, yeah, they he, how old was he? I don't know, his dad was a stuntman. Oh, right, okay. And so he went on set. Um, it, yeah, early teens. So, yeah, so kid was early teens and he got given golf. <laughs> 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 to be fair, golf was in there ten times and there was only one. <laughs> yeah, you know, Rocky. Beer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, was, there was only one in there that said Cobra, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> what you um, in the fridge? <laughs> <laughs> And um, just one last thing I've just got to say, how fucking great Stephen Rear is. <gasps> He's not in it much, but he mm-hmm. is fucking great. He really feels like uh, that bit at the end where he confronts it, Brad Pitt, I just, it's yeah. like he's channeling London After Midnight. Yeah. He's you know, he's so good in this, like outstanding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's another actor who I feel has been massively overlooked. Like, yeah, I, I didn't know his name at all, but you know who he is when you see him, yeah. don't you? I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. He's been some fantastic stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jennifer and I, uh, Christmas before last, watched the whole Probably of Dick Dickens- even. Watched yeah. the whole of Dickensian, uh, which is a, yes. a main character yeah. in, which he was fantastic in. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, since the pandemic, uh, we keep saying we're going to rewatch all of Utopia, mm-hmm. but mm. it would probably make me shit in my pants. Uh, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, that's a good point. I haven't thought First about time. Utopia. Yeah, I haven't thought about Utopia since the world sunk down its own half. <laughs> um, although, you, although you do get some hot Palpatine action in the last few episodes as well. Yes. So, one of the greatest but, TV shows ever, but it, oh, oh, there you go. That's one for Bobby. Sci-fi. If you've not watched it, not it is sci fi. But late. Don't mm. watch the remake, but mm. do yeah. watch He's Utopia. He's watched it, isn't he? American, the remake. Yeah, I, I don't think he does. Oh. No, yeah, but it, it, it doesn't it. follow much of the okay. same course right. thing. Yeah. Um, hmm. But, and I've just got to give a uh, mention, he starred as Clove in a 1991 adaption of Endgame by Samuel Beckett, which is what made me love Samuel fucking Beckett, because it was like, <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> Where it's him marching up and down, getting the itching powder, while... Norman Beaton from Desmond's is blind in a chair, asking him where his pap is. And you're like, <laughs> what the fuck is this? That was a late night. And, um, but yeah, and, and I think, because um, obviously he was in the crying game, he was like the main star in the crying game. And I always forget like V for Vendetta. Yeah. Um, and um, what was it? Uh, Company of Wolves he's in, obviously. He's in lots of fucking um, Steve. Uh, uh, Neil Jordan films, obviously. Um, but I really now want to watch The Doctor and the Devils. Have you seen that, Ray? No. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, I think there's another one, but this is from like the 80s, but it sounds like it's mm-hmm. really fucking good. Um, and just on, on, on a non um, sci fi thing, when he played Gatehouse in the Shadow Line, he was the best fucking screen villain of that year. He <laughs> was brilliant because it's basically like this he basically turns up looking like when um eric malcolm used to walk off during ernie's song <laughs> <laughs> but he's but he's come to fuck you up <sighs> and it's just like just utterly fucking terrifying isn't it? he's brilliant um but uh but yeah so jennifer i don't think you gave us your point score oh yeah well i'm not sure i did after you <laughs> lot but no. I, I don't know. I thought you were all fair. Um, and I think I'd go in apes. So slightly higher. You know, mm. it's not top film ever. But actually, it really stood up because I thought I was making Lee watch it. And I was like, oh, it's going to be a bit rubbish. I liked it as mm. a kid. It won't hold up. Considering how many horror films, you know, we've watched for this and are really mm. seen across genres and so many different ones now compared to when I was 16 watching it. But yeah, I, I thought it really stood up. I thought, as I say, it was it was gory enough, it was mm. funny enough. Obviously, good actors, as we've talked about. I think it had enough. You know, the score was good. Uh, mm, you know, yeah. to be fair, I, I, I did. I, I really liked it the music. Together, yeah. And I think yeah. because of that, it does stand up. 
Yeah, I'm going yeah. with an eight. <laughs> you're, 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 you're all making me regret, as I did when I was watching the film, you're making me regret that I sold the soundtrack to Cash Converters many, many oh. years ago. Oh, uh, I've had it, yeah. I haven't found it recently, so I don't know where it is. <laughs> no, it was on CD. <laughs> it was I, on did, <laughs> I, had the gun, I had the Guns N' Roses song on cassette. Oh, I had to speak it much, much, much to my shame. Just, just like Armand, we're making you regret even more. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's not our intention. <laughs> right. So <laughs> we've gone on again longer than the film this evening. Hey, so, uh, hey, hey. Just, no, no, barely. Half past. Uh, anyway. We've got six more minutes and then two more minutes. Did, did, did we get Claire's score? Oh, well, yeah. What, what, what was your score? Up with an eight. Well, I only sort of half watched it. Okay. Uh, so a double uh, score. What? We're a double, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I don't think it would be fair to score it. Oh. oh. I love. Not, I not. love. I'd give it 10 out of 10 for 10 out of 10 gay right. innuendo. <laughs> <laughs> and I did spend most of the film wondering if Brad Pitt's hair was real or a wig. Oh, no. I it must have been a wig. It was so bushy, wasn't it? Yeah. It was impressive. <laughs> I don't know, he used to he had a full head of hair. Yeah. Maybe he had it like back combed for the year, uh, you know. Yeah. Did, did, he have it, did he have it long in Legends of the Fall as well? Yeah. I, I, yeah, could, could, have yeah could have been. At the, at the time, because he'd just done like, he did California at the time and stuff like uh, that. So he, was, he had it was quite a long hair. It was shoulder length, wasn't it, in California? Yeah. So yeah, maybe. Could have been really and, in, and in True Romance, where he's the Christian Slater's stoner. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's got long hair in that. Well. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Yes. So thanks very much, everybody, for listening. Uh, happy birthday to Jennifer. And, uh, happy, birthday. happy birthday, Jennifer. Um, and we are back in a fortnight's time for our next 90s amazing movie. Uh, it is going to be Claire's birthday choice. Have we already oh. announced it or is this our first time? I think we already announced it, but let's think, tell them again. Yeah, I think we already did. So next, we are doing 28 Days Later. Um, hey. Will it be 28 Days? No. No, it won't be. No. Uh, <laughs> yes. So I'm very much looking forward to talking about this because, as Claire said before, I think she said this was a film that she saw when she was much younger and it put her off of horror entirely. Oh, no. So I'm very... No, I think it's a great step forward. It's, but- Point of the show is to get people yeah, into, into horror, yes. so for people to return. Yeah, it's and it, it put off because it was too scary. Yeah, mm. not because yeah. it was too bad. Yeah. No, too <laughs> scary. No, oh. it, it wasn't a critical decision. I think she just crapped herself. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not next time, right, then. <laughs> Excellent. Right, so we shall find out the gory details next episode. So thanks ever so much for listening, everybody. Uh, go and check out the Not for Everyone podcast. Uh, check out all the other shit we've been talking about and we will see you in a fortnight's time for 28 days later good night good night